We have our EU ambassador, Ms. Nona Dupres, um, as a chair of the event. Welcome, Nona. Um, and we have our esteemed panel members. Uh, we will come to the introduction part. Uh, most, but most importantly, I'd like to welcome all our enthusiastic audience who have uh, registered and shown interest and participated in today's program. We welcome you all. Uh, as you know, the topic for today is uh, youth and digitalization. And you know, basically around the context of COVID, how it has impacted and how the learning has changed. So we will hear from all our panel members, their different points of views. Um, yeah, and this is the main, uh, you know, the topic for today's discussion. So with that, now I move to our panel members. I request the panel members to please provide their introduction and slightly touching upon their current experience and expertise around, you know, how they have contributed to youth and uh, digitalization process. So I am uh, Raksha Paudel and currently I'm working as Senior Technical Advisor at Plan International Nepal and uh, I look after the uh, area of youth empowerment and uh, sexual and reproductive health rights. So talking about uh, how we have been working to contribute to youth and digitalization, uh, we are like uh, primarily focusing on girls and so we are very much concerned about how we can uh, with the advancing technologies how we can uh, promote girls access to uh, internet and girls access to uh, technology so that you know the way we are kind of uh, promoting their uh, uh, promoting to contribute their uh, empowerment we, uh, we can we need to kind of focus on uh, the advancing technologies and girls access to that and currently we are starting with uh, girls access to social medias my name is uh, Sushil Shrestha. Uh, I am from Kathmandu University. Uh, I work as an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. And we have one uh, research lab called Digital Learning Research Lab, where we do several research on online learning system. So I recently completed my PhD in learning analytics, which is related to online system. And besides that, uh, I'm also the associate director of Eastern Welfare Directorate of Kathmandu University. Basically, uh, regarding this digitization, uh, I did my master's thesis and also the PhD in digitization. So uh, my PhD was uh, focused on how we can develop a learning design, which will help to uh, provide a suitable content, especially in the, in the field of uh, online learning. We all know that uh, after this post-COVID, we're having a challenge on applying suitable ICT tools in our education. So my research lab is focused on developing a learning management system. We are recently building a personalized learning system to provide suitable content to the different types of students. Thank you. My name is Riti Fristra. I'm a computer engineer by profession and I've been working as a software developer at Kotiviti Nepal. Uh, at Kotiviti Nepal, uh, it's an institute, uh, I mean, it's an organization that specializes in U.S. healthcare analytics and it basically liberalizes the digitization of healthcare industry and uh, provides analytics for uh, better and qualitative healthcare. Um, apart from that, I've also been involved in uh, one of the uh, companies, youth companies that uh, that was started by my fellow uh, uh, fellow, uh, I mean, friends, uh, that is Dollar Tech Nepal. It uh, specializes in uh, u utilizing the technology for different uh, real world problems. And one such uh, example of uh, digitalization in youth is uh, the product MCQ Hall, which specializes in uh, uh, providing um, online based platform for uh, preparation of uh, different kinds of examinations and uh, uh, facilitates the students to um, online education. Uh, yeah, that's all for me, sir. Thank you. My name is Nona Dupre. I'm the European Union Ambassador to Nepal. Um, as such, I'm absolutely not specialized in digital, so I'm very happy to be on this panel and to the specialists. Um, at the start of her tenure, European Commission President um, Ursula von der Leyen, she launched two parallel uh, transformations, digital transformation and the EU Green Deal, which is there to become the, the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And they are really both needed because digital technologies are crucial also for us to achieve decarbonization. But at the same time, digital technologies need to under, undergo their own green transformation. So I would like to give the, the EU perspective to this debate. 
Namaste everyone. My name is Amin Shakya and today I'm representing Erasmus Mundus Nepal. I am an alumni of the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Program funded by the European Commission and I specialize in flood risk management. My expertise lies in disaster risk management and in technological applications for social good. Uh, a bit about my background, I have previously worked in earthquake recovery in Nepal and have some experience with technological applications for supply chain management for medical supplies. Uh, that's all for now, thank you. I'm Sagar Prazudi, youth and gender activist, public health practitioner. My academic background is public health and currently, I'll, today I'll be reflecting on the digitalization in the health system and I'll be analyzing or reflecting on the uh, digital, uh, digital connectivity and use from the GESA perspective, gender equality and social inclusion perspective and from the mental health perspective. And recently, I work with the uh, government of Nepal, Department of Health Services, for the unified data management and analysis system for COVID-19 prevention and control, epidemic forecasting and uh, prediction. So I have been working on the different, uh, I provided the technical support to the Bhimath municipality, municipality tunnel for uh, epidemic uh, COVID-19 prevention and control uh, through different initiatives. Thank you, Sagarji. Uh, can we have a round of applause for all our panel members? <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, now we enter into our round of discussions. Uh, as we know, COVID, COVID is the current topic. Uh, I mean, our topic is centered around the impact of COVID. Uh, so I'll start with my questioning. Um, Sagarji just mentioned about his experience working in health system, the digitalization of health system. So I'll start with you, Sagarji. Uh, can you share what's the main learning from your experience uh, in terms of you know how it has impacted your working modalities and how you digitize the health system and, you, and your partnership with the government as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Again, we are in back in 2019 when we have the first case of COVID-19. And again, in 2020-2022, we are even discussing COVID. So it's all about the COVID. So uh, basically, I will be focusing on the digitalization approaches that has been taken in the uh, Nepal for uh, COVID-19 prevention and control. COVID also known as the first global pandemic of the digital age. The everything changed in a day we, when we got the first case of COVID-19 and our system has the limited surge capacity. And with the limited, limited surge capacity and the health service provider will uh, uh, we'll have to, uh, again, add up to the digitalization in a quick way because we don't have the, any options available. And the, every, every sector, every sector have to explore their the digital potential and the health sector was the one system which cannot wait till the till the COVID-19 cases can decline because the day we uh, we reported the COVID-19 cases, then the health system have, has to be ready to adapt to the digitalization. And there was a two burden because we have the COVID-19 cases that was a new uh, new cases, and uh, by side we have to continue the essential healthcare services by uh, by side also. So. It was the system was overstressed because we have the limited health service provider and we were not prepared at all because uh, uh, it was a global pandemic. So uh, emergency and immediate digital solution became in our immediate necessity. There was no option. We cannot say uh, let's wait for the COVID then we can act. So it was it became an immediate solution and essential. And by side we have to focus on the essential healthcare services. So healthcare service provider and the system became compelled to. Uh, digitalize or have to go undergo the digitalization process. And at the beginning, we can see there was a the, lot of infodemic. There was all about the COVID. When you go into the Facebook, when you go into the Twitter, when you go into the everywhere, there was the COVID. So a lot of myths, humor, and the misinformation were circulating, and the, there were a lot of information. And we saw the people sharing the best, best fact and information, which created the fear among the public. So by side there was the digitalization was the one approach for the health system to tackle with it but the government has to prioritize the risk communication and the community engagement strategy to make the communication not so linear we have to respond to the public but may the rumor are circulating around the communities so even the government to, uh, took that steps at the early phase of the uh, covid 19 and by side uh, there were the different innovations and the intervention were digitalized like we can see there were the covid 19 system checker in the different mobile application where we can know whether i am uh, I, I, whether the symptoms i'm having are similar to covid 19 or not so that, that way the system was digitalized. And similarly, the government, uh, I guess, uh, if anyone had the COVID-19 in Kathmandu or out of the district, I, I guess they received the call on six, nine days of their COVID-19 because the system was digitalized. 
we had a system that is called information management unit at government system. Uh, the, it was so quick, it connected the three levels of actors, municipalities, lab, and the hospitals. If you go for the COVID, if, if you went for the COVID-19 testing, for the PCR testing, then automatically your personal details or the social demographic details were digitalized. And even if you, if you are not letting your municipalities know, the system, uh, the information went to the municipalities and they, are, they can know whether you are positive or negative or whether your result is inconclusive without any communication between that channel. It was all digitalized. And if, if you were positive, then there, there used to go the blink blink on their mobile application and they have to immediately start the contact pressing and case investigation. So this way the system was, uh, system was digitalized. So to contract every, every uh, uh, close contact of the cases and to have the, uh, to, to know whether the which provinces or which geographical areas or which uh, ethnic groups are having the high number of cases. So we, the national level uh, interventions or policies can be guided. So similarly, uh, similarly, it unified the data management system. So which helped us for the uh, epidemiological prospective analysis and for making the plans. Similarly, we uh, continued the essential healthcare services to the teleconsultation uh, tele services and the telecounseling services because we cannot wait till the COVID full decline. And uh, with uh, and similarly, different partners, NGOs, and the different. Uh, IT companies double the different tools to digitalize the health services. We have the real-time max monitoring initiative taken by the UNICEF. Similarly, GIS uh, tool were used for the COVID-19 monitoring. And uh, we, we now, uh, from the government perspective, we have the COVID-19 portals where you can see the real-time data of the COVID, uh, where we can, the daily reporting of the cases. Similarly, vaccination, good practices reporting, health sectors, and the uh, health facility registry and hospital different initiatives are being taken by the government. And now the main point is this were the some initiatives taken by the government. But why digital, digitalization in health system is necessary is the main question I, I guess you want to hear. So the digitalization in health system makes the services easily accessible because we can see a long, uh, many, many people waiting for the health services at the government hospitals. So there is a scope that we can digitalize it or, or uh, we can make the appointment systems or make the functional link, linkages between the, between the peoples. And similarly, uh, we, digital, we digitalize our system so quickly, there was no time, uh, no time. so it, it was circuiting COVID-19 pandemic throughout our community. So whether that time, the question was whether the system, digitalizing system, where they were equally easily accessible to all group of people or not. Where, that was the question similarly. And we, what we realized is that the, there was a reluctancy to the, uh, digital tools, platforms, matter uh, developed at the various levels of service delivery because the health, co health worker, health service provider has to do the same function, of the, uh, they have to do the same responsibility with the addition of the COVID-19. Uh, so it, it makes them reluctant to learn the digital or to adapt to the digital health system. Similarly, uh, there were the automated messages on different mobile application, software, tool words, software and tool, tool words developed similarly. And now what may be the way forward or what may be the learning from the COVID-19, maybe the, uh, we can have the electronic health record or electronic medical record in our upcoming days. And similarly, individual health profile and maybe the digitalization in health system could broaden the scope of the research, research purpose also. So the person get, uh, after the birth, we can have his electronic health records. So we can track what were the, uh, whether he were vaccinated with the basic vaccine immunization or not or we can track what, what were the health problems or what were the, his conditions throughout the, his life. And so we can intervene uh, accordingly and can also help us to uh, uh, help us for the research purposes also as well. So there were the may, different medical mobile apps developed. So I guess the COVID digitalization and the, uh, the COVID-19 was the turning point for the digitalization health system. We got to learn alert from the COVID-19. So it opened our and it, it helped us to realize the health system and health sector to know our potentials and where we can go. And uh, uh, basically essential healthcare services and the, we can have the COVID-19 again and again. So it made us to realize our potential and uh, the need to digitalize more health services again. Thank you, Sagarji. Um, I, I think it nightly, nicely sums up how our health sector, you know, quickly adapted to the COVID situation. And it does bring, bring back a vivid memory of, you know, the early days of COVID-19, where you're trying to test that you are not 
uh, COVID positive. So I think it was a good uh, overview and also, you know, you correctly uh, highlighted the access uh, and, you know, the digital divide situation and uh, rightly the opportunities moving forward. So to now bring slightly different perspective, I'd like to request Amunji uh, first and then maybe Shritiji, you can also add, uh, you know, the uh, digital, obviously we've seen that it has accelerated the digital transformation process all over and, you know, education is one of the sector as an Erasmus uh, you know, and I, uh, can you please share us your own experience with us? Uh, COVID has accelerated digital transformation everywhere as um, Sagarji just elaborated for the health system. We can see it in our e-wallets, in home food delivery, which has increased much more than three years ago. Um, the stock price of Zoom kind of looks like a COVID wave now, like it peaked when COVID was peaking and now it's going kind of down again when I check lastly. And at the same time, when it comes to education, I think the online education resources, there are so many good resources out there and uh, people are finally tapping into them now, like uh, massive open online courses in Coursera, et cetera, are much more popular now, I think Khan Academies, et cetera. Um, similarly, I can think of uh, Code for Nepal, uh, collaborating with uh, Data Camp, around last year to make sure that people in Nepal can have access to free coding tutorials from very high quality material, etc. Uh, coming a bit back again to my personal experience, I was an Erasmus student when this COVID pandemic happened. So I in a way lived and I, I did my master's from four universities as part of the program. So in a way I lived four different pandemic lives in four different European countries at different stages of their COVID waves with different policy interventions. Uh, yeah, four crazy semesters I get, but briefly elaborating on my first COVID semester in the Netherlands. Uh, I was doing it with IH Delft, the Netherlands, which uh, uh, is quite uh, active in training of government engineer, uh, government personnel worldwide, as well, well as per their UNESCO partnership. So they were already quite well equipped with uh, online classes, et cetera, that they had to do for their short-term courses. Uh, so when I was in the Netherlands, my institute at the very least, very quickly adapted to the online modality. But at the same time, I could equally see many, especially senior professors who were used to giving uh, lectures in person who all their life, having to quickly transition to the online modality and it also had some problems and okay, how do I use Zoom now? Or like, how do I switch, switch up our camera? Or like, a lot of hellos, I guess, at the beginning of the class. So I guess it's, uh, we have really moved to a digital world because of this unfortunate situation, but perhaps it's uh, got a lot of positive changes as well because of that. Thank you. Thank you. I think continue to have that discussion around your experience later on as well. Uh, Shritiji, do you want to, uh, you know, contribute to this discussion? Any benefits, your own experience and disadvantages of the online learning? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, the COVID times were dire situation and um, uh, with almost uh, every institute around the world being shut down for education, uh, it was uh, quite a um, um, difficult situation. and. Uh, especially in context of Nepal where online education was not uh, not an option and uh, was never been heard of before. Um, but uh, this situation of COVID definitely has brought a uh, positive change to the Nepali education system. Um, uh, especially uh, since, uh, since the traditional way of learning is being practiced in our education system, um, the online way of learning has definitely had, uh, had several benefits over uh, the existing system. Like, uh, for example, uh, I think online education system has introduced a more um, effective way of learning as students can get um, involved in audiovisual uh, communications and uh, animations are being used and uh, AR and VR technologies are being used in uh, the classrooms uh, these days. Apart from that, uh, online learning tools like uh, uh, some of the uh, noteworthy uh, online learning tools like OLE Nepal and uh, My Second Teacher and uh, 
uh, uh, several others like um, Moodle and uh, Google Classrooms have definitely been uh, providing the better way of uh, teacher, teacher and uh, student communications. And um, it has definitely helped in uh, practical and more conceptual learning rather than theoretical knowledge. <clears throat> Apart from that, I think it has broadened the horizon of uh, uh, education overall because uh, a student can learn from anywhere at any time and uh, on any topic if he wishes to these days. Uh, most of the elite universities like uh, Oxford and uh, <clears throat> Imperial World College and uh, MIT, Harvard, they all, all offer uh, their course contents uh, available freely online. So students can definitely check them out and uh, learn uh, whenever they like uh, in a self-paced manner. So yeah, definitely online learning has been a boon for uh, our times of education. Yes, thank you, Shrutiji. I think rightly highlighted the context in Nepal. Uh, I probably will talk about the disadvantages or some of the consequences of digital learning, maybe later. Uh, Nona, now I'd like to request, I think you can bring us, uh, help us understand how Europe has changed or what or didn't change or what has the impact between uh, of the COVID, especially with the digital education. Although we know most of the developed countries, they were already equipped or utilizing those um, online platforms. But, you know, your own uh, experience would be very grateful for our audience. Thank you. I think um, COVID has led to a big debate in Europe about data protection. You know, all of these uh, online applications where all of our health data are just, um, I mean, where we want to make sure that our data are secure. Um, and I think that is, um, it has been a very lively debate. Uh, data protection has always been high on the priority for Europe. So I think we are now very well known for data protection. You know, when you have to uh, start uh, clicking all of those things, do you want your data to be shared or not? I mean, some people think it's a nuisance, but it is really there to protect our privacy and our data. And data is, is just power and money and might. And these data are just being used uh, for artificial intelligence, for and just to use us as consumers. So um, I think that is one way where Europe, where the European Union would like to uh, promote, you know, global rules. And we can, I think, leverage those by having a big market. Mm -hmm. So we uh, create these rules that are there to protect our citizens. And these are being adopted in other parts of the world too, because they want to be allowed onto the European market. So for example, the data protection rules have been adopted by many countries in Asia, in Latin America. And I think that's a, that's a very good thing. Um, very recently also, uh, European Commission and European Council, they, they agreed on um, something which is called the Digital Service Act. And I think that is also because I think you, the first speaker alluded to it, about misinformation and disinformation, and you alluded it about harassment. Um, and that Digital uh, Service Act is also, I think, a very, very important piece of legislation um, because um, its intention is to make sure that everything which is illegal offline becomes illegal online. Um, and we hope to also that that Digital Service Act would be enforced um, in other parts of the world. So I think um, there are many pitfalls with digitalization and many wonderful things, of course, because I mean, you are all in the fields of digitalization um, because it brings us together and it brings our societies and people closer to each other. But we also have to make sure that we promote an, an, an open, a sustainable and a democratic uh, society. So for us, it's very important that digital is at the service of the citizens and of society. I think that's very important aspect of, uh, you know, uh, digitalization that you highlighted and definitely Nepal has a lot to learn given like, you know, how we have moved into an online system and, you know, there's not enough protection against, you know, consumers and how their data is being utilized. So that's very correctly highlighted. Uh, now we will slightly enter into a more pedagogy um, logic, you know, like how it has, the COVID has impacted the teaching methodologies, uh, not just at, you know, schools level, but also at the university level. So we have Sushil Ji here in our audience. So I'll request Sushil Ji 
uh, given your education background, can you uh, give us, uh, share us your example and experience how the COVID has impacted or changed your teaching style? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think, uh, first of all, we need to understand the difference between digitization and digitalization. So uh, digitization basically means uh, making digital content or converting from analog to digital. But digitalization is more challenging, I think, because it addresses the need of the user, like how you are going to provide the suitable ICT tools to achieve the goal. We have many options. And uh, this recent uh, COVID has created this problem in our country. Like th there are, for a long time, uh, we were far from the education because we were not digitally ready, uh, even the instructor as well as the students. So after a long gap, uh, basically we adapted the online education. And especially in uh, government school, uh, I find uh, teachers, uh, they were struggling with the adaptation of ICT tools. Uh, I myself was also involved in several trainings. So this is a big challenge for our country. So, but we don't have any other option now because this COVID can come anytime. So it is unexpected. So we have to be digitally ready. So it's a big challenge uh, in our country. Uh, so as far as my uh, background is concerned, so I was focused on developing the instructional design, like what sort of pedagogy is relevant in online education. So I was uh, working uh, in that area uh, since last five years, and uh, we developed a MOOC system in Nepal. So MOOC is very popular. Uh, we all know, I think, about the MOOC, but uh, we developed our own MOOC system, uh, uh, realizing that one day we have to move towards virtual university. So the COVID has uh, created that opportunity. What we thought long time back was uh, come into reality due to this COVID. And uh, from MOOC, we were able to aware uh, like what sort of teaching style we should add up developing the instructional design. And coming back to now the existing current scenario, uh, I think there is a big challenge to the instructor as well as the student also. Like the instructor are not aware or they are, uh, they are feeling very hard on how to develop the content to teach to students. And students also, they are not very much aware with the ICT tools and this uh, learning through Zoom or Google Meet. It is very difficult to sit in the same place for two, three hours. It is not uh, easy to sit uh, for a long online class. Especially this has hampered uh, the small children most. So uh, what I did is uh, my research lab is now currently working on uh, developing a personalized system. So what this personalized system means is uh, we are trying to develop an adaptive content which will focus the need of diversified students. Like I think here most of us are students. So we don't have the same learning style. For example, some may prefer audio content, but some may prefer video content, some prefer to read by slide, some prefer to read by even uh, book offline. So we cannot provide the same content to this diverse student. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop the adaptive system, which will analyze the user behavior, what sort of uh, teaching style, what sort of learning style they prefer, and we will provide the content according to their need. So I think this is the future. And, uh, and the next thing is we need to first make our instructor uh, digitally adaptable. If your instructor are not digitally adaptable, if they are not friendly with the system, they cannot teach in a better way. So uh, some initiative has been done by the government, but I think uh, we need to develop um, more learning management system like uh, my second teaser and then even I think Fuse Classroom. So those are some of the examples. But uh, for higher education, we need to develop some kind of adaptive system. So we cannot develop a same system and then uh, deliver to different levels of student. So the most um, major focus has to be in the asynchronous content so that uh, the student can uh, read the content uh, in their preferred time. And we need to adapt the concept of flipped classroom. 
So we cannot just ask the student to sit for two, three hours in online. It is not easy. Even for instructor, it is very difficult. So we need to move towards a flipped classroom, flipped learning concept, and as, as well as developing the asynchronous content. So if we do this sort of things, then I think uh, we will be ready slowly on the future of creating a blended learning approach and even virtual university if this COVID comes again and again. Um, Susanji, thank, thank you so much. I'm, I might just ask you one question about your uh, the personalized learning system you said. Have you tested out that system and have you checked the responses? Yes, uh, we recently developed uh, our own system and then we did uh, the usability analysis of the system. And uh, uh, we, uh, we did the experiment, experiment of the student who used the normal Moodle system and our customized system. And we did the usability survey, which shows that students were more satisfied with the type of content we have been providing. And even uh, we have implemented the uh, approach of gamification, right? For example, if you are more active in the system, then you will get more point. What we are trying to do is we are trying to develop the motivation among the students. We are not forcing them to use our system. So we are also integrating some gamified elements. So through gamified elements, what it will create is, it will create the motivation, it will create the self-awareness, it will create the increase the user interest among the system. So we are trying these sort of things and the result has been quite impressive. And uh, I have been testing this with my system, my uh, uh, students who are using my system and they are very much satisfied uh, even now they are asking is, sorry, only you are using the system. Well, why not you spread the system and give training to other uh, places also? So the response has been quite good and we're really trying hard to develop the customized system with focus to the users. Um, or the so students. Thank, you. thank you so much. I'm just conscious of the time as well. So given we have, uh, you know, other panel members to get to and other uh, important questions to, you know, discuss and address. So now I'll move to Rakshazi to bring in a little bit of, you know, project perspective, a project he led um, at Plan Nepal, and uh, which was delivered through social media, something similar to what I did uh, in our project, Dakshita. So I find that very uh, similar. But when you're talking about that, do also try to touch upon how you reached out to the, you know, um, girls, uh, you know, the social media user. Was the access same or different? I'm sure like it would be different. Uh, given I had similar experience. So over to you, Rakshaji. Yes, thank you. So yes, um, so for Plan Nepal, uh, innovation and technology was one of the uh, emerging area of interest in our new conscious strategy. But, you know, this COVID really pushed us, us, uh, pushed us further to kind of think about what we are, we can do in terms of uh, increasing girls' access to technology. And for that, uh, we, we kind of, uh, I mean, we kind of discussed about, uh, you know, what would uh, be best for those girls uh, with whom we are working, because the girls we are working are from like very remote areas and from the rural uh, background and uh, who are like uh, economically backward and so on. So we had to kind of really think about, you know, what would suit really uh, for them, what would be really best for them uh, so that we can, uh, you know, leverage uh, the... I mean, we can further work out to them in increasing their access or increasing their awareness on the use of technology. So we kind uh, kind of discussed and and came out uh, with a, with an idea that uh, we can use the existing social medias and and for, we further kind of uh, uh, found that you know the best uh, I mean the mostly used social media is Facebook and uh, most of our girls that we are working together with are kind of using that social media. So with the with the idea of using Facebook as a as a means. We, we kind of started a Facebook page which is um, which is called as Girls Out Loud and because we are kind of promoting you know uh, girls to be more uh, to be uh, to voice out their concerns and to be more articulative and you know to to kind of uh, lead and to decide for themselves uh, this this was a really good platform for us so we started with like 50 girls in the beginning uh, from two districts and uh, we started that uh, in July 2021 and uh, now uh, like until date uh, until like last month we have like more than 1600 plus uh, girls who are the members of that Facebook page and they did 
it has been a really good platform for them to kind of discuss on various issues uh, relating to you know their menstruation menstrual hygiene management uh, sexual and reproductive health and um, because also because this is kind of very exclusive for girls and we are kind of targeting only uh, girls of like 13 to 24 this is kind of a very close platform and very secured platform for them to kind of voice and discuss about various concerns and issues and you know their uh, challenges and uh, because they are also engaged in plans various programs they also share about their achievements and uh, success stories so that all the other girls can learn from them so this has been a kind of really um, you know this has been uh, benefiting the girls so much in understanding about gender dynamics and you know inequalities issues and what they can do at their level to kind of promote uh, gender equality and also like you know engage other girls to be aware of you know various issues related to girls including violence and so on and together with that we also uh, because they are like i think we'll come to the pros and cons later but then we, we also wanted to kind of uh, make girls aware about you know the risk associated with being online or risk associated with uh, using technologies so I think we'll discuss that again. Uh, so thanks. Like if you want to now. So, right. uh, so yes. Um, so we we kind of uh, wanted girls to understand about you know how um, you know diverse or how uh, this technology has to be kind of used and uh, it it also comes with like various you know kind of uh, let's talk about cyber bullying right so because this is um, uh, you know when the facebook was uh, like new to us we didn't know what, what how should we use it and we we used to kind of post whatever we wanted and it was kind of you know uh, talking about yourself or screaming about your inter internal and external in, in an open field right so that was a, that was the thing we wanted girls to understand that this has to be like really uh, used um, used well and understanding all the risk and uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, negative aspects of uh, being in the in the social media so we kind of uh, uh, also taught them to um, understand about what are the risks associated with it and what are the reporting mechanisms if they are, you are kind of um, you know if they if you face any kind of harassment of violence uh, while being in the social medias and and so on so so it was a it was a very kind of insightful um, idea for the girls to understand about the risk associated with it, and it's, they need to. We also wanted them to understand about it's not only about you know posting pictures and seeing how many likes you get, but also understanding that who is looking at your picture or who is collecting the data, as uh, Nona said about the privacy privacy and security right so th those aspects where we also discussed on those aspects and um like supported girls to understand those as uh, the the you know negative aspect or you know the things that needs to be considered while being in the social medias and so on so we are uh, really like planning to um uh, increase our membership in the in the girls out loud uh, facebook page and together with that we also have initiated a chatbot uh, which is called as maya chatbot and it is it is a chatbot to kind of support girls and young women and also men to understand about you know trafficking issues and this chatbot has now uh, more than 8000 users and uh, like users have been kind of getting very uh, good information about you know the uh, trafficking and how you can be uh, you know can c get into trafficking and what are the informations uh, uh, you need to understand or get or where where are the reporting mechanisms and so on so th uh, this is how we are kind of using this uh, technology to to uh, reach out to uh, our uh, young people and um, uh, we look forward to Raj, the thank you Rakshasi. Uh, I think while also highlighting the opportunity, you rightly uh, highlighted the challenges and the risks of you know uh, digital connectivity. Nona, quickly, do you want to give us an overview of the EU um, strategy in the field of connectivity? Do you want to bring that here, or you can come later? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move forward. Um, so we are uh, almost towards the end of the discussions. Um, 
but I think Rock says he's uh, correctly helped us kind of move into that discussion by talking about the risks and uh, challenges. Um, so I'm talking about the general social consequences and challenges. You know, it's very access. Like my one year old already knows how to, you know, operate Zoom, and now he's using Google Classroom, and you know, he has uh, his screen time has increased, and you know, YouTube has all kind of uh, content that's being sent to my son, and there's very little monitoring that I can do, given you know I'm so occupied. I know we all have these kind of different experiences. Um, so I'll first uh, I'll request Sritiji, do you want to come in here and help us understand some of your own challenges related to you uh, to work around this? Thank you. Uh, well, there are a lot of ch challenges that are uh, concerned with online learning. Uh, first and foremost, I think it has created a kind of digital divide among the uh, people. Um, uh, those who know the technology and, uh, and those who are in available availability of technology can uh, excel their way through online learning, but uh, those who are not aware of technologies are still left behind. And uh, apart from that, it has also created, uh, it has exaggerated the already existing uh, economic divide. Uh, that is to say, uh, it, um, uh, online learning requires uh, infrastructure like uh, connectivity, uh, I mean, internet connection and uh, different devices uh, to be able to connect to the internet. So this has also created um, a, a kind of um, economic division among the uh, society. Apart from that, uh, like uh, my fellow colleagues also said, uh, the, the problems of data security and pri privacy is also a serious concern. Um, from my own perspective, uh, I've faced, um, uh, well, I think uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, online education has been a boon rather than a uh, curse because uh, uh, those institutes that uh, and that would not have uh, moved to online education and uh, uh, distant learning have now been moved to uh, that modality and thus uh, uh, provided the accessibility to education. I myself have uh, faced a, a lot of problems uh, as I used to go door to door to different colleges in, during high schools for education, but uh, I ended up homeschooling for some reason. Um, but uh, had it uh, had it been uh, online education uh, had it had the online education been uh, accessible on that on those days uh, that would have been um, a great opportunity for me as well. So that in that sense, uh, it has definitely been a, um, a good uh, change. <clears throat> but uh, highlighting on the cons of it. Uh, especially for those disabled ones who uh, require special needs like uh, uh, like for uh, computer vision, uh, like braille and uh, braille support and everything. Uh, it, it, it is kind of difficult because uh, we need to create the content again for online platforms. So it has been uh, problematic in that sense. Uh, all in all, uh, it has both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and disadvantages can always be solved by uh, alternate uh, solutions. And that is uh, also possible through the use of technology. Thank you. Dizzy, I think that's very relevant and, uh, you know, um, given the experience, I think we have had more opportunities uh, in the context of Nepal. But Aminji, I know you've had slightly different experience. You're just coming back from a rural uh, Nepal and you know the access and divide uh, in terms of uh, was varied. So do you want to slightly touch upon that, but very sh very briefly, because we are running out of time? Uh, yes, thank you Reshuji and also Shristiji for uh, elaborating on digital divide. Um, I only came back from a remote district in Nepal a couple of days ago. Uh, was there for some survey work for my professional commitments. And yeah, when we talk about uh, digital transformations, it's all good in paper, it's all good in Kathmandu. Thankfully, we have 24 hours electricity a day, more or less, less or equal, I guess. Anyway, not very good anymore, but still. Um, but yeah, uh, I was going through districts to like remote wards, wards with no access to roads, no access to electricity, especially in monsoon as uh, electric towers were uh, like uh, destroyed. Uh, no telecommunication or internet. And when we move forward, in this digital 
world, are we leaving people behind? Like, uh, I, I know in some villages, uh, people are taught using radio because that's the only thing that works over there. I, I know some children who attend classes from their mobile phones because a household probably cannot afford four laptops for their four kids. So these are questions we have to really ask, I think. And I'll be very short and hand over the floor to our moderator. Thank you, Aminji. I think uh, the infrastructure commitment, government commitment, and you know, uh, these are very essential that you know the, this reaches out. Nona, you. I think maybe now is a is a good moment to intervene on um, on what we call global gateway, which is the European Union strategy to better connect the world. Because you mentioned being in a remote district, so we really want to offer a a, a credible um, choice for partners um, to invest in, in connecting people to people. So including in digital, in health, in education, and in transport. But what is very important for us is that it would be green and sustainable, um, but also that it would be transparent and that it would promote good governance. So it's the idea is absolutely not to create dependencies, but also only to invest uh, where it's needed, where it's... Um, sustainable so where we have really like an environmental impact uh, assessment uh, and where it can also provide added value um, and then it should also of course be always in line with um, with human rights um, and democracy so just wanted to mention this this global gateway I think that's a very good opportunity um, so now slightly talking about uh, the consequences. Uh, I would like to invite Sagarji to share his own uh, experience, or rather, you know, help us understand, you know, how this, uh, you know, proliferation of, you know, uh, access to digital world has also impacted mental health, you know, uh, a lot of time, and how there is so less uh, monitoring because of that, and how do we create a safe digital space, as Raksha is slightly tossed upon earlier, and how do we make it socially inclusive? So, yeah, over to you, Sagarji. Uh, thank you so much. Seconding to all the panelists, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, we all have, I went to my home, which is in the rural area of Nepal, and yeah, even uh, being so privileged and having access to all the digital tools, platform and method, and having a certain level of uh, information and idea about the digital tool, even it was a struggle for me to adapt into the digital spheres, digital sp uh, spaces all around, because everything changes so quickly. So similarly, we can see the digital divide in terms of uh, the resource available is uh, mentioned, whether availability of internet or availability of the laptops, mobiles, and different things. Similarly, in terms of the digital skills that the young people or the, uh, the people have, individual can have. Uh, similarly, the quality of use, quality of used divide we can see in uh, after uh, the immediate outcomes of the digitalization, uh, uh, immediate outcome of the rapid adaptation of the digitalization. Similarly, we can, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the, uh, as mentioned, epidemic of another epidemic. We saw the mental health issues uh, arising throughout the globe. We saw the children, young people being at risk of cyber, uh, cyber, cyber bullying, online grooming, hate speech, discrimination. Similarly, we, we saw the the, uh, the increasing cases of the mental health issues. So it was the physical spaces and the digital space was completely different because uh, the physical spaces, I have to meet someone in person, but in digital space, I'm easily available and I can connect to anyone through the digital platform. So it was completely different and it was somehow every individual has gone through the different struggles because there were the insecur insecurities and the uncertainties at the first of the pandemic. We don't know what, how long we have to wait. Everyone was waiting when we can have a, a normal, when we can normalize everything. So there was even uh, some, due to lack of the digital skills, uh, some of the individuals have to left their job or company, uh, fire them because they do not have the digital. All of a sudden the COVID happened and they have to adjust into the system. So there was the different mental and the social consequences. So the digital divide again, uh, wasn't a digital tools method and the platform we, we, we had wasn't able to reduce the inequalities we had before. 
but rather than it broadened the gap or it broadened the di digital divide. And so it resulted into the consequences in the socioeconomic inequalities. Similarly, uh, the digitalization in education put children at the risk of cyberbullying, online grooming, hate speech, and different, different social, uh, different mental health issues. Uh, so we, we saw the uh, increasing tendency of the suicid suicidal tendencies, self-harm behavior, anxiety, depression, eating and uh, sleeping disorder among the young people. This was just just few numbers, we have more to go. So similarly, the COVID-19 pandemic limited us. All of a sudden, we have to sit in our room, we have to work digitally, all of a sudden, it changed. So it limited so social and the cognitive uh, development of the children. Because, but uh, as mentioned, the digital action have the advantage and the disadvantage. Similarly, there was a digital space where the people can connect or can socialize to the some moment because we, we are getting back to normal again. But so, uh, that time it limited social and the cognitive development of children. So, uh, it, it, so we cannot say that the digital action has bring alert. It, it, it becomes a window of opportunity for us, uh, for us because we realize our digital potential. We realize the need of digital action in every sector, health, education, and every sector. So again, we have to move forward with. But what are the solutions we can manage? So how we can ensure the safe digital spaces, whether my data, data and internet are safe or not, or whether my information that available there are safe or not, or privacy or confidentiality issues is where they are. So it's, it's time we highlight or we move forward again with the digitalization, uh, prioritizing the cyber education, uh, educating young people about the risks and security, similarly building a cyber security resilience system at the national level so, so that we can enjoy or we can enjoy our digital rights and can feel safe at the digital spaces. That's all of it. Ms. Agarji, I think uh, you rightly highlighted the digital device, you know, was not the only reason. I mean, it also caused stress and not just the content that we were consuming or how long we were consuming. I think that was very correct. And thank you for also giving us the options how we can, you know, minimize uh, some of the challenges. Um, so with that, we I actually would uh, we wrap the main discussions, but I would like to give the floor open uh, for our, uh, you know, yes, we have a hand raised already. Uh, so yeah, the floor is open for questions. So given the kind of time constraint, maybe we'll just have a few questions. Please, uh, your name and your question to the panel member. Hello, everyone. My name is Ajay Yadav. I'm a student of development studies. And uh, election is coming up. And when we are talking about youth and digital connectivity, I do believe that the content of elections will be a very essential com uh, component to be discussed. But unfortunately, we're not able to highlight on that aspect. So right now, when we see there is a campaign, election related campaign, mostly from social media, that's very good thing because we are exploring new element, uh, new way of how we can promote ourselves. But uh, if you look at the past, when we see incident like Arab Spring in Egypt or Tunisia, when these social media how uh, you know driven the entire nation in a, a very uh, you know un undecided or very unpredictable ways. So my question is that: Do we have appropriate mechanisms to control these things? Uh, I don't know whether this question is relevant to the, any of the uh, panelists, but if you have knowledge, please do share. And also, uh, regarding, we initially I heard the term like misinformation, disinformation. Uh, the people who are residing in cities areas or urban areas, they do have the concept of this, but me, someone from uh, representing from a very rural part of Nepal, I'm from southern part of Nepal and a very bordering area, area of Nepal and uh, India. So I have seen the people or the youth from my village, whenever they see a content, without uh, doing any cross question, they just start sharing that post in their community. And that's a very serious issue. Uh, and I think, uh, do we have appropriate mechanisms to, uh, you know, when we, we are currently celebrating digital connectivity, but are we prepared enough to, you know, face the consequences that this digital con uh, connectivity might bring in the future? Thank you. Ajiji, I think I will, uh, you know, agree to most of the things that you have said, like the contents that is being shared without the understanding of it. Um, but I don't think we are any of uh, the expert in the panel that can rightly answer your uh, question. But I'll keep it open if anyone is interested to respond. Yes, Nora. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, we've seen with digital technologies that indeed disinformation and misinformation increases. Um, by both state and non-state actors in many, many domains, including here in Nepal. Um, and it is very difficult to counter because, of course, they have very massive uh, resources at their disposals with trolls and whatever. Um, but I think this is exactly what the European Union is trying to combat, by making it illegal to post fake news and by making the platforms responsible for this 
uh, websites that post the fake news, and so by making them accountable. Um, so that is one way where we hope that it will that those platforms will be made more accountable to delete some of the fake news. But of course, we have to make sure that this still respects human rights and freedom of expression. So it's a, it's a fine line, and I think it's very important that we are aware of, of both sides um, of, of that disinformation, misinformation, and fake news. And we have massive campaigns in the EU to dismantle fake news, to really these, these fact checkers. I think that is really important. And also just campaigns to raise awareness on fake news. So we have a campaign saying, think twice before you share, no? and, or, or check it before you, you share. I'm, I'm not saying this is the, the global panacea and we'll provide any, um, the global response or the global solution to all of this fake news. But I think it's good to be aware and to start um, the fight against this disinformation because we are being more and more polarized and more and more being surrounded by our own opinions. Um, so it will be more and more difficult for each other to understand each other and to understand the opinion of the others, whereas we have to live together. <laughs> I think that was a very good example. I think that's a good takeaway. I'm sure we have a lot to learn uh, yet to create those kind of mechanisms. Hopefully we are moving towards that. Uh, Ajayji, uh, any more question from the audience? Yes. We just talked about the remote areas of Nepal, rural areas of Nepal, and the situation of girls in those areas are still very miserable. They are still being harassed. No matter how Nepal is being digitalized, but they have no internet connection, they have no any digital connectivity, and they have no medium to raise their voice out. They are, uh, they fear, uh, they fear to raise their voice. So how is your organization uh, planning to uh, reach out to those girls who have no internet connection. There is not uh, proper transportation facilities. So how can they be um, included? How can they be considered in uh, your organization? How can they be protected by your organization? Thank you. Thank you so much for this very important question. Uh, so regarding internet connectivity, yes, you are very true that uh, we work in some of the areas where the internet connection is like very poor and they uh, and also on top of that they do not have access to the equipments as well they do not have smartphones and so on so so in in some places we have a kind of established uh, center where we have equipped with you know computers and uh, data connection system so that they have access to internet and uh, you know those do, who do not have mobile phone or smartphones with themselves can come to the center and you know uh, understand about how computer works and how technology I mean internet works and what are the informations that we can uh, uh, like get through the internet and websites and so on so that has a kind of that has been a kind of initiation that we have started but it's still a long way to go because like uh, you know it has to be in the system that needs to be strengthened in terms of uh, having ac having the rural uh, areas access uh, the internet right so that has been the initiation from our end so far. And beside that, um, uh, regarding like expressing their voice and concerns, uh, we work through like our local partners and we have kind of uh, developed like uh, groups of uh, girls and boys at the local level. And we, we have our Champions of Change uh, methodology, which, uh, which has a different, um, uh, like which is a curriculum of like different uh, modules. And it talks about like you know understanding gender and understanding what is violence and understanding about you know sexual and reproductive health rights and so on. So and also understanding about you know what are the different kinds of uh, sexual and physical violence that can happen to them, right? So in in those forums also we talk about you know how to raise your voice and we 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 work on the uh, you know agency development for girls so so that they are able to speak up and they are able to uh, kind of you know voice out for any uh, issues that come across so that has been the initiation so far and through our like safeguarding mechanism we ensure that there is no harm uh, for girls uh, you know, like uh, uh, whether it be from our partners or from the from the other stakeholders we work with so we ensure that they are protected and uh, you know, uh, they are free to express themselves. 
So thank you. Um, thank you, Rakshaji. I hope Asitaji that answers your question. I think that remains a you know continuous challenge and projects and programs like us, you know, continues to try to develop new methods how to you know uh, uh, minimize those divide and increase access. Uh, we are almost at the time, so maybe if there is uh, any important question other than what has already been asked. Yes, so we'll take one last question. So uh, my mommy is a teacher in a government school in Kathmandu. Uh, so when Amji said, um, leaving Kathmandu aside, uh, other um, the schools and education institutes uh, in other countries are in a, other parts of Nepal are in a very vulnerable situation when it comes to e-learning. So uh, I live in Naikap, which is um, inside the valley, of course. And she teaches uh, social studies and economics. And during the eight months of the uh, pandemic, the first one, the first lockdown, uh, the total number of students in her class were 30, but only six to seven were present throughout the eight months. Uh, so my question to Aminji and Sushilji, because uh, you both have been working in the uh, educational field. So uh, can you give me any examples of any educational institutes uh, which have better handled the situation? So the situation of the number of attendees in online classes in government school in Kashmandu and other parts of Nepal were definitely very, very low. So any examples and um, do you have any idea of what the government is doing? So let's say if we are anticipating another phase of lockdown soon. So is the situation of education um, e-learning going to be the same or has there been any changes? Do you have any idea, examples, anything? Uh, Sushinji, would you like to respond? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for a good question. Uh, one thing, uh, our, un our country is uh, very diverse, you know. Uh, when you see our seven provinces, they are not equally developed. So uh, what should we do? In my opinion is we cannot adopt the same strategy in all the provinces. For example, while I was giving training to the head teachers in one of the training, one uh, lady head teacher told me that uh, she was from Karnali province. So your training is useful, but how I'm going to implement? I have no internet facility. So in that case, uh, we cannot adapt the same strategy. So what should we do is, if we have a no internet facility, then we have to provide education through radio or television. If we have poor internet facility, then we can provide the content through pen drive or some other devices. If we have a good internet facility, like in Kathmandu or some major cities, we can provide through Google Meet and Zoom. So what I'm going to say is uh, we have to plan a different strategy on how we are going to deal with the online education in different provinces. That's my first point. And the next, uh, next regarding the attendance is a big problem, yes. Because instructor has been teaching, but uh, it is very difficult for students to uh, sit in a classroom for a long time, as well as they have a very poor internet connectivity. So they have a fluctuation uh, many times during the lecture. So for that reason, uh, I mentioned about asynchronous content. So what asynchronous content is, you can develop your content because uh, most of the head teachers, most of the teachers have a smartphone. Uh, buying a smartphone is not a big uh, thing nowadays. So you can develop your presentation using even PowerPoint and you can upload those videos in a YouTube channel or you can share that uh, your slide or the content through some uh, group. Uh, in that way, what the students can do is, if they are having internet problem in the during the classroom, they can read, they can go through that lecture uh, in their other preferred time. Uh, maybe some going to some places where they have internet. So uh, we need to promote uh, the uh, content. For example, this panel has been recorded. So all the uh, interested are not able to come here. So now what, when this uh, panel is, uh, session is uploaded in YouTube, then it can be uh, listened by a large audience. So in that way, we need to record our content and provide, especially in the, in the country like ours. Thank you. Uh, Susanji, thank you so much. I think uh, for also giving us some real-time example from of the current uh, discussion setting. I hope Paramitaji that answers uh, your question. I think uh, the response to that would be like you know we do need a larger government co commitment to you know as he said like you know we need different strategy to address 
uh, different parts of the country and these uh, issue, uh, although you talked about something very close to home and that is a reality. Uh, but I think it's a continuous work in progress. Um, yeah. So with that, we'd like to wrap the discussion uh, for today. I think we've already noted the key highlights from today's. We talked about the impacts of COVID, not just in education, but also in health sector and, you know, what are the solutions and how we diversify, how we, comp uh, you know, quickly adapt it to different uh, online technology um, to reach out to, you know, um, our beneficiaries. We also, Nona also highlighted, you know, the risks of digitization, I mean, uh, having digital connectivity and GDPR correctly, the global data protection, um, you know, um, the act that, you know, so, sort of helps uh, throughout Europe and it's also adopted uh, by a lot of countries throughout because it provides the right to the consumer to ask questions how and where my data is being utilized. So that's a very important uh, uh, regulation. Um, and we also talked about the opportunities and challenges and, you know, we try to weigh out the pros and cons. Uh, but I think for a context or a country like Nepal, uh, for the last two years, uh, I think despite the situation, the education sector not, was not hugely hampered. We were able to, you know, pull through and adapt to, you know, digital mode. So that was a very um, important, I think, from the country's perspective, if I have to speak. And we also slightly touched upon the mental health uh, aspect of the digitalization process, which is also a sort of, um, you know, the reality. Um, and yeah, I think that's still a continuous work in progress. Uh, with this, I would like to say that we have come to the end of the discussion. I'd like to thank all our esteemed panelists. Let's hear a round of applause for everyone. Um, and yes, and thank you so much for all our audience and, you know, very enthusiastic. And thank you for asking the questions. We really welcome that. So we hope to remain in touch. And I think this will be webcasted or, you know, shared through our social media channel in a few days' time. So please do. Uh, stay tuned and as we just uh, Susan just, just highlighted you know the way to reach out to maximum audience is to reshare it again rewatch it rethink it if you think it's applicable to your content to your audience within your uh, you know uh, social media then do share it further so with that I'll sign off thank you so much everyone <laughs>